please have Moyes in the pledge. Pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Hoorah. <laughs> Thank you. So we have something a little new uh, on the agenda tonight, and it's called 30 Seconds in My District, emphasis on 30 seconds. <laughs> so um, I would like to take this opportunity to start around and have everyone, all my colleagues, to do one fun, happy thing that happened in your district this week. Dr. Gentry. Um, you'll get a bigger update from Jolton Middle in the L5 report. I'm very excited about what's going on there and excited about my opportunity to help prepare the students for their participation in the uh, presentations at Tennessee State University. Oh, great. Dr. Brannon. As a result of one of our school visits, we have student ambassadors that will be reporting tonight from Overton, John Overton High School. Thank you. Amy. I just want to highlight some good work going on at Big Picture High School. Um, I recently spent some time there, and it is a, it's an unusual school. It's a smaller personalized learning environment for students with a student-teacher ratio of, uh, of 15 to 1. They boast 100% graduation rate. Their core value is kindness. And it's the only metro school featured in Edutopia's schools that work. Um, Shay uh, Denning Snorton, who's the principal there, uh, she uh, recently attended Women in Leadership at Harvard, and she is the 2017 Salute to Women um, honoree by Phi Beta Sigma. And the uh, Cassidy Martin, a student there, recently won the Southern Ward Poetry Slam at the Frist Center. And I, when I visited there, I was very impressed because the students, they spent a couple of days going to internships. And so I heard from several students and what they've learned on their internships. And there was one student who um, wanted to be an architect, and he had already worked with an architect for an extended period of time. So great things going on, and I invite anyone who wants to visit the school to go over there. Uh, Mr. Pinkson. I mean, she already broke the 30 seconds. <laughs> I wasn't looking. <laughs> um, so I, I booked a meeting today uh, that's going to happen next week with Dr. Felder and uh, the leadership of Croft Middle School, which is the zoo school, which backs up to the Nashville Zoo. And we have potentially a corporate partner in line who is going to make a sizable technology investment in the school to help uh, create what we call virtual zoo uh, to help students monitor animal, animal behavior remotely. So there's a lot of work left to do, but that's my excitement for the day, and I'll report back when it's a done deal. That's great. Uh, thank you. I want to highlight the good work going on at Dan Mills. Uh, I had the opportunity to sit in on a team, <coughs> grade level team meeting, and uh, it's a first grade team meeting, a professional development whereby uh, it was their planning period, and they had student work. Up. They had running records, and they had uh, student writing samples. They also had books by Lucy Calkins and some other, uh, you know, great professionals where they were relating theory to practice and uh, making that prevalent in their classroom. Thank you. Hunter. Yes, I would like to highlight the work that's going on at Lakeview Elementary Design Center. Um, Dr. Shoemate is doing a phenomenal job. Um, we had a team there this morning, um, a leadership team there, and we had an opportunity to tour the school and to hear some of the work that they're doing there. And it was also great to see the leadership style that Dr. Shoemate is using. And she had high praises for our um, evaluation system for her teachers. Um, so. Yes, snap it up for Lakeview. <laughs> Ms. Pierce. Yes, I want to highlight uh, Cicely Woodard, who is an eighth grade math teacher at Weston Middle, and she's the only Metro teacher um, who is a regional level finalist for the Tennessee State Teacher of the Year. So we are rooting for her to go all the way, and her class is a great class to go visit if you're ever over at Weston Middle. Thank you, Ms. Bugs. Uh, Lachlan Design Center Elementary School, they placed in the city, I believe, for their chess, uh, their chess team, and they'll be going on to the next round of, um, of competition. And then, of course, Stratford, my main zone high school, we have uh, Dr. Or Mr. V Dr. Vincent Jones, who was nominated as the Assistant Principal of the Year. They also, he also started their cadet program, and they ranked in a statewide competition for their what, Dr. Steele? 
the, yep, their mock trial team. And one of the students from Stratford was asked to play the role of the prosecutor. Yep, he did that. So good job, <laughs> Stratford. <laughs> Thank you, Ms. <Spike. laughs> and I will say um, for myself, um, I'd like to. Uh, uh, I went to a, a music program at Ruby Major Elementary. I tried to, to call him Mr. Callios, and he said that was his father's name, so I have to call him Sam. He won't let me call him Mr. Callios, and he does a phenomenal job at Ruby Major, and they did their version of American Bandstand. They called it Ruby Bandstand, and they did all the songs from that we, well, that I remember from American Bandstand. I know the kids probably didn't have a clue what they were, but they did a really good job, and they had actors. They had a little boy who was the, the MC, and they did a really good job, so that was a very enjoyable program. So thank you, colleagues, for participating in that. I appreciate that. We'll go on to awards and recognitions. Um, Dr. Joseph. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, here in Asheville, we are incredibly blessed uh, to have a number of colleges and universities that partner with our school district in many ways to benefit our students and staff. Belmont University has created an incredibly unique and generous program that gives dozens of MNPS graduates the opportunity to uh, attend this prestigious local university at no cost to them. In the spring semester of 2016, there will be 91 scholars enrolled in, Bridges to in the Bridges to Belmont program. Uh, they come from four of our high schools, uh, Maplewood, Stratford, Pearl Cone, and White's Creek. Many of them are first generation students to attend a college uh, from their families. The program will celebrate its first graduating class this spring with five young women completing uh, their program at the end of this academic year. The students in this program have a wide array of accomplishments including participating in music ensembles, working as a resident assistant in student housing, studying abroad in Haiti, participating in various alternative spring break and mission trips helping host 65 eighth grade students from Stratford STEM for a college exposure event, helping host 42 sixth grade students from Jerry Baxter for Read Across America Day, and acceptance to Meharry Medical School in the BS to MD program. Uh, these students have not limited themselves to working and serving solely on campus. Scholars have worked at community centers, Goodwill, YMCA, tutoring, and room at the inn, just to name a few. Uh, both on campus and off campus, these students are immersed in the lives of their community. Their hard work is paying off and we're thankful to Belmont University for giving this opportunity to our students. Now let's see a brief video about the program. Hey, this is Dr. Steele from Stratford High School. How are you doing? I'm good. How are you? I'm well, thank you uh, for asking. Hey, listen, uh, I've got someone here that wants to talk to you. Okay. Mama. Yeah? I got the scholarship. You did? Yep. Yeah. <laughs> Congratulations, baby. Thank you. Congratulations, baby. I'm so proud of you. I'm so, so proud of you. Girl, we're really proud of her. She's a great young lady, and we're uh, excited for her next four years at Belmont. Oh, my God. This is a dream come true. Absolutely dream come true. And I, I've, been, I've been telling her that for a while. Hello? Uh, sorry, Alan. Yes. Yeah. Me uh, dieron a scholarship para uh, Belmont. <laughs> de la escuela. Oh. <laughs> Para Belmont. Oh, 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 oh. ¿Me dieron la escuela? Yeah, me dieron la escuela. Ay, qué bonito, qué rico. Me dieron uh, los cuatro años. Me van a pagar todo. ¿Ahora okay. pagar todo? Sí. Hijo, está bien, güey. Está bien, güey. Sí. Oye, pues. Sí, ahí va. No, no, ahí. 
Bye bye. Congratulations. Um, okay, what is it? Well, he's going to need some stuff that says Belmont University because he got a scholarship to Belmont University. Did he, did he get it? He got it. <laughs> oh, thank you, Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> that is, I'm telling you, you have made my day. <laughs> Hello, what do you want? Hello, Papa. Hello. Oh. Ah. Uh, Dr. Steel phone by here. Okay. Hello. Hello, congratulations, Bill. Thanks. You are welcome, Bill. Very good, very good. He said you made my day, sir. Thank you. Yes, very sir. Much. Thank you. We will. We, he makes our day when every day he comes to school. He's a great young man. <laughs> hey, Tracy. Yes. This is Dr. Steele Stratford. <clears throat> Hi, Dr. Steele. How are you doing? Good. We're just so excited. We, we're so, we just love you so much for all that you do and then your family. And then, of course, you send your kids here and you trust us with them and we love them. And Jack's here in front of me and we just told him that he's going to Belmont on a full scholarship. Oh, my gosh. Oh, my goodness. I just want to cry. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. I just appreciate you guys so much and for everything that you guys have done for this neighborhood and for our family and for our boys. You know, we just never imagined it would be this sweet and this good and this promising for him and for all the kids that you guys pour into. And I'm just so grateful for you guys. So, do I call you? Do you want me to call your mom or dad to let them know that you did get the scholarship to Belmont? <laughs> Sure, yeah, call my mom. Call your mom. <laughs> call your mom. I'm going to call your mom, but your dad's been listening. He's on the street. Hi. Well, I have Ambrose in my office, and we just informed Ambrose that he's got a four-year scholarship to Belmont University, and he wanted to call Mama first. here also and we're, we're just thankful for him <laughs> and for you guys tell you to talk to you later we'll, we'll, congratulations, congratulations. Okay, my amor, te <laughs> He got the scholarship? He got the scholarship. Oh my gosh, good for him. Congratulations, Nady. I love you. Thanks, Mom. Love you, I'm sir. proud of you. I'm happy for you. Wait, are we allowed to call you Nady? <laughs> <laughs> no. Okay, all right. I'm okay, just making sure about that. committing. Oh, yeah. yeah. I'm good. Oh, yeah! Obviously, this program would not be possible without the leadership and vision of Dr. Bob Fisher, who has transformed Belmont University into a rapidly growing, nationally recognized institution for higher learning during his 15-year tenure. And we're honored and thrilled to have such a strong private university partner supporting our students and helping them achieve their post-secondary aspirations. And I'd like to ask for a round of applause for Dr. Bob Fisher and Belmont University in recognition of this remarkable gift. <laughs> students.
would ask Dr. Fisher to say a few words. Well, I'll be very brief, but um, I don't know what there is to say after you view these. Uh, uh, Dr. Steele's been doing these videos for every year. He's usually more cruel than this. Uh, <laughs> he, he makes them worry, and then he tells them they've got it. He builds it up. You know, lots of drama. You know that. <laughs> uh, but it... I would just tell you after you say that, you can't imagine the privilege that it is for our university to be able to do that. Nashville has been so good to Belmont. It's just incredibly blessed to be in Nashville, Tennessee. Nothing has made us, nothing has meant more to our success over the last several years than Nashville. And when we decided what can we do to give back to Nashville, this was a program that Dr. Steele and Dr. Woodard and I put together and said this, this is something we can do. And this fall, there will be 124 Bridges to Belmont wow. scholars at Belmont, full rides, room and board, tuition, everything. And we started not knowing where the money was. But this is the easiest money I've ever raised. And Milton and Denise Johnson, a Stratford graduate, Milton Johnson, was who that went on scholarship, a single parent, worked all the way through college, gave $5 a month uh, to Belmont once he graduated, and then it went to 10, then it went to 15, and then it went to 25,000, and then it went to 10 million dollars that he's given to this program. Joe and Ann Russell also with a heritage in Nashville Public Schools, four million dollars. And I can go down the list of board members and donors to Belmont who said, we want to help out with this. This is some, we built 500 million dollars worth of construction on our campus, beautiful buildings, all that. But our board will tell you this is the most important thing we've ever done. And I'm so proud to be a part of it. Thank you for this recognition. I accepted on behalf of our faculty, staff, and, and those beautiful students that you've sent to us. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Fisher, before you go, if we could take a picture. And also, we have the principal, I think I saw the principal of Pearl Cone here, if you can come on up, and Mike, if you can come on up, and the principal of Maplewood is here as well. We usually have tissue up here. What a night for it to be gone. <laughs> And tonight we have several sports recognitions, starting with our only middle school student to be recognized tonight. Antonio Tony Anthony was named Mr. Basketball through the Charles Davis Foundation Awards Program. Tonight, uh, Tony, an eighth grader at Brick Church, a lead public school, led the Bears to a 16-4 record in a season that ended with a city championship game loss in late February to John Early. Of the 17 Charles Davis Award winners, Tony had the highest grade point average, along with teammate Doug Hooten and coached by Brick, Church, Brick Church's Jay McGinnis, Anthony will play in the City Middle School All-Star Game on Saturday, May 4th. I'd now like to invite Jay Brown, Brick Church's Interim School Director, and Coach McGinnis to the podium to say a few words about Tony. Thank you all again. Good evening to everyone. Um, I'm going to speak on behalf of Lee Public Schools as well as Brick Church. Uh, my name is Jeff Davis, and I've had the privilege to uh, work with uh, Mr. Anthony over the last year. And as I watched that previous video that just came up on the screen, all I could think about is the next generation. And one of the things that we aspire to do at Brick Church at Lee Public School is to uh, instill those core principles for our young people to become the next generation of success.
process. And to watch uh, Mr. Anthony uh, travail in all of the uh, adversities that he faced uh, and to come out with the high academic achievements and actually uh, carry our team to a city uh, finals, it's just a tremendous uh, blessing to, to work with this young man. And we're, we're looking forward to him uh, making an impact in Nashville over the next four years. So again, thank you all uh, for having us and honoring uh, this young man and his endeavors as he moves forward. Thank you. Does Anthony want to say anything? No, I'm good. <laughs> Got some recruitment going on early. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, we're going to combine the next two recognitions since they're both celebrating the basketball talent at our own Maplewood High School. First, Maplewood High School made history on Saturday, March 18th, with the boys' basketball team securing the Class AA state championship, defeating, defeating uh, Knoxville Catholics by a, a score of 60 to 57. This was the first boys basketball title for Nashville Metro boys since MLK won in 1996. So that was 21 years ago. Woo! And here's an interesting fact. Uh, current Maplewood coach Ty Wilson was an assistant coach under James Doc Shelton for four of the seven years that Martin Luther King Jr. Magnet High School went to the state tournament. Maple, Maplewood was led by two-time Mr. Basketball, Bo Hodges, who scored 18 points and seven rebounds in the championship game. He was also named the Class AA Tournament Most Valuable Player, and Bo was named to the all-tournament team along with two Maplewood teammates, Hassan Littlepage and Robert Wilcox III. Congratulations to Maplewood and to Bo on his personal accomplishments. Now I'll invite Maplewood Principal Dr. Keely Jones Mason and Coach Wilson to come up to say a few words about this incredible team. First off, we want to thank you guys for inviting us. Um, we're fortunate and privileged enough uh, enough to have the administrative support that we have at Maplewood. They were behind us the whole way, rooting us on, and you know, just just being there for us from a, um, from a distance. Secondly, these guys want to thank these guys for putting in the work um, all summer long, and uh, they never doubted that we couldn't bring the go ball back to, uh, first off, Maplewood and Metro. And we're, we're elated and happy that we've done that. Um, our assistant coaches, y'all are staying. They put, stand up just for a sec. They put, they put a lot of work in. Even when the guys were upset with us, we knew what the vision was and what we wanted to do. And so uh, we're just happy and excited that we, that we did it and we want to do it again. So we just want to <laughs> just thank you. And we want to keep doing it. All right. <laughs> and I just want to say that being at Maplewood for five years, I've had the pleasure of watching this team grow and the program to build. And I'm honored that they are, each one of them are part of Maplewood. These are good boys here. 
a lot of them on the team have 2.8, 3.0s. They could go anywhere academically, but blessed to go. We have a couple of them blessed to go on in athletics. So that's a blessing. Great students. Bo Hodges two times, Mr. Basketball. Great parent support from him. His family is here. If you guys will raise your hands, uh, they're blessing to have them. students from that family. So can't say enough about Ty Wilson. Honor to work with him. Dr. Ollage, if you will raise your hand, he's our athletic principal. Our athletic director is here too, I believe. If you would just raise your hand. To work with. Can't say enough about him. Thank you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Come up for a picture. Where's Trophy? I was about to say, I want to touch the gold ball. I want to touch the gold ball. I know, right? <laughs> 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 did they re oh, the I did. I saw that. That's a good news tonight. Yeah. And finally, tonight we're celebrating the incredible season of the Pearl Cone girls basketball team that came in second in the Class AA state championship on Saturday, March 11th. This would have been the Lady Firebirds' first state championship win. They fought hard and came incredibly close. It was a narrow loss, 66-62, uh, to 62, with Putnam County's Upperman High School taking the title. Now I'll invite Pearl Cone's principal, Dr. Sonia Stewart, and coach uh, Kendra Bailey to come up and say a few words about this incredible team. Well, thank you. It's fantastic to be here, and congratulations to Maplewood as well. I'm really excited about the work of these young ladies this year, and I've, I've said to them, uh, really putting Pearl Cone girls basketball back on the map. There are four seniors behind, behind me, and they have carried this team, and they've carried it through work ethic and through commitment and hard work and accountability to each other, not just on the basketball court, but every single day in the classroom, and they have done a tremendously good job. We're sending one of these young ladies off on a Division I scholarship, first time in more than a decade. Wow. Another one back there we call CP for college player. She doesn't know it yet, but we're still working to get her in that place, and she knows exactly who she is. So we're excited to share this with you. At this time, I'd like to introduce our head coach, who is also the district coach of the year, Miss Kendra Bailey.
<laughs> well, first of all, thank you all so much for having us here today. Um, we just want to thank the board, the community, the parents, uh, our administration who's been behind us 100% throughout the season, the students, the community, everybody has just supported us so much um, through our journey. I'm so proud of my team and the work that they put in throughout the season. We had a lot of long days, a lot of long nights, and a lot of hard practices, and they continue to persevere, so I'm super proud of them for that. Um, my coaching staff, who was with me in the trenches every step of the way, the late night phone calls, um, the late night practices, the car rides home, everything. Um, but just thank you all so much for supporting us, for having us and celebrating us in, um, on our journey, and just pray that you hope to continue to support us in the future. We'll move on to the next section, and the good news is, um, Dr. Narcisse. Yes. Boom, boom. <laughs> Going to give an update to our L5 school, so uh, Dr. Latrice will go to Ms. Latrice. Good evening, Chairman Shepard, Dr. Joseph, and members of the school board. My name is Latricia Gloucester, and I am an L5 executive lead principal, and I'm very excited to stand before you to share with you the works that, is, that are occurring at Jolson Middle School. We have Principal Todd Irving and the L, and the L5 team here from Jolson Middle School who will who'll share with you some of the great works that, is, that are occurring at that school. So at this time, Mr. Todd Irving. Going on. Always clean. Sorry. <laughs> 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 Um, well, thank you, President Shepard and Dr. Joseph. I want to share with you some of the exciting things that we're doing at Yelton Middle School. I think one of the things I want everyone to understand is that so many times as the principal, I get a lot of credit for what happens but one of my philosophies is that we're better together. And so what I'm going to do is go through some things that we have done at Jolton, but what's gonna be very important is that you're gonna hear feedback from the teachers who are in the classroom every day, who I consider to be the experts, and then our most prized clients, the students. So one of the things that we say at Jolton, we want every student to have hope and growth. We want every student to walk on a campus and feel they have hope to be successful. If we're giving every single student some type of hope, we're doing our job. But along with that academic, along with hope, they have to have academic growth. And one of the things we're really emphasizing is every single student has academic growth. But this has to be with a sense of urgency. Every single day that the students step on campus, we want to make sure that we're working with a sense of urgency. 
We have two areas that we're focusing on at Jolton. We're focusing on instructional focus, which is really focusing on literacy, and then the climate and culture. You have to have both of those working hand in hand for the campus to be successful. We want to focus on three areas, and these three areas are very important. The first area is student-centered learning. We want to make sure that everything that we do at school is focused on what's best for students. But in order for that to happen, we want to create an atmosphere where we're treating teachers as professionals, and we're giving them the professional freedom to do the things that they need to do to be successful. The second area that we're working on is the UACIF framework. And with the UACIF framework, we're looking to increase academic vocabulary, because if we can increase academic vocabulary, it's going to help the students be successful. But what UACID also does, it has 21st century components. We want our students to be ready for the 21st century. And now, an area that I think is very important is restorative practice. We want to make sure the climate and culture is the right way. And one of the ways that you make that happen, you build positive relationships with students so they feel that they have a significant an adult that they have a relationship with and they really care for them being successful. Going into Jolton, one of the things that I noticed right away, we had the highest number of suspensions and expulsions in the district. So if you have a high number of suspensions and expulsions, how are you going to have a climate where students want to come and learn? How are students going to be academically successful? So what we did right away, we looked at the four categories that had the highest number of infractions. And we looked at disruption of schools. If you have disruption of school activities, how can you get some good quality instruction? So we really focused on that. So if you look at the bar, you can see 2015 and 16, and look at 2016 and 17. You can see a significant change in the number of classroom disruptions, which is really important. Now you have a significant number of less classroom disruption, which means you have fewer suspensions and expulsions. I think this is a very important graph to look at because when you look at two years expulsion and suspensions, what we did, we looked at our data from last year and this year, from August to March 17th. And what we want to make sure that we were doing, we want to look at the number of days that students were suspended and making sure that we don't suspend. And if you look at the instructional days gained, we've gained 91 instructional days already this year. So you look at 91 instructional days, that's half a year of academic growth. That also shows that if you have the right system in place, students can be successful. Now what I think we've created is for now teachers to be professionals and give some good quality teaching. What we're going to do now is look at our EL benchmarks comparison. And what I'm going to do, I'm going to ask Ms. King, one of our teachers, to come up and talk about what she does in her classroom. Hi, I'm Victoria King and I'm the sixth grade ELA teacher at Jolton Middle Prep. This is my first year at Jolton, however, not my, thank you, Principal Irving. However, not my last. Um, so, just a couple things that I would like us to notice about our ELA benchmark. This is for all ELA grades um, throughout the school. It does have last year, 2015 to 2016 in blue, and this current school year in orange. So just a couple of things that um, I want to make sure you notice. Unfortunately, the first and second benchmark, we were a little below um, the percent proficient from last school year. However, last year there was a decrease, whereas this year, as you can see, we are showing a steady increase in our number of students that are scoring proficient on these benchmarks. So how are we attaining this increase? Um, I believe one of the key things is what we call the UACIT framework. So UA stands for understand, apply, communicate, and extend. All the teachers have this chart hanging in their classroom every single day. It is filled out for the concept they want their students to grasp fully. In math, it might be a skill like graphing. In English, my example, it's the issues that Wes Moore faces in the book that we were reading in class. 
Then we start with the understand part. We want to lay that good foundation. Okay, we're going to start with background knowledge. We're going to go to academic vocabulary such as summarize, convey, but we're also going to have content vocabulary from whatever they're going to be reading, listening, um, watching. Then once they have that solid foundation, we're going to move on to the application. That way it doesn't just stay up in the theoretical, um, but the students can actually apply the English skills that we've been working on all year to whatever concept we're working on. So in my example, um, they actually had to look at different public service announcements and determine the central idea. And then they also had to summarize an issue in the book that we had been reading. They didn't know it yet, but they're going to create their own public service announcement about that issue that they had already determined. But then to help prepare our students, um, we also push them to communicate, not just in multiple choice tests and worksheets like when I was in school, but we want to push them to communicate orally in whole group settings, in partners, at tables, um, but as well as in written format and through the use of technology, through posts on places like Edmodo and Padlet. Um, and then this benefits the students because they're learning how to effectively communicate through a range of um, outlets and it also benefits the teachers because I'm able to see how well do my students really understand that concept that I've pulled out and are they using their English skills effectively. And then the last, the fourth and final pillar um, is the extend, okay, the extension of this beyond just the classroom. So there's a couple of ways that we do this. So in this one, they actually had to create their own public service announcement about the issue that they had already determined from Westmore. But then we also can do cross-curricular. If you were in Hammurabi's day, you know, what kind of public service announcement might you have wanted to create for the people in his kingdom? Um, but then also make those really valuable real-world connections, such as, something as simple as whenever your friend asks you about a movie that you saw, what are you doing? You're summarizing. You're picking out those central ideas and supporting it with details um, or something deeper like what are issues that you see in your neighborhoods. So I am a big fan of the UACIT. Um, I think it you know, increases their engagement, but what we're also seeing is that it's in increasing their knowledge and helping them reach that proficient level. Um, and I believe that with the increased application and the use of this UACIT framework next year that we're going to continue to see this increase. And I'm really proud and excited for our students. And now this is Mr. Gann, and he's going to come talk about math. All right. I'm Elijah Gann. Uh, this is my, I'm the current eighth grade math teacher at Jolton Middle School, second year at Jolton Middle School. Last year I taught seventh grade math. It was my uh, first year teaching a content area outside of special education, and I joined Jolton Middle School as a member of the MMPS Turnaround Corps. Okay, let's look at the data. For this chart, we compared our school-wide proficiency percentage in math on the MMPS benchmarks. Um, hold on a second. All right, here we go. All right, visually our chart shows that over the past two years we've had consistent growth in math. Um, in our first year, we began with the 1% proficiency rate. I mean, I, I know you guys understand percent, so that's one out of every 100 students were proficient in math in our school for their grade level. Uh, by the second benchmark, we increased that to roughly 5%, um, which we had a lot of work to do that. But we began our turnaround work last year with an uphill battle. In the battle towards individual and school-wide mathematical growth, teachers and students alike attempted to reteach themselves how to enjoy learning and find the value and connection to day-to-day -day living skills with the math that we do in school. If you've ever taught math, you know that especially when you get older middle school students, they tend to ask the question of why, what, how, when, where, and then over again. Um, 
At times last year, when attempting this work, students and teachers alike met opposition in the form of apathy from staff, little to, little to no school-wide structures, and hostility towards personal betterment. Regardless of this, by that second benchmark, they did have a 4% growth up to, five, up to 5%, which just in the math, that's about 20 more students that were proficient on the first benchmark on the second one. Uh, comparing our benchmark performance to last year, we began this school year with a 2% per proficiency rate in math. Uh, so not a major gain, but we didn't move backwards, which is definitely positive. Um, by the second benchmark, they had increased to 7%, and this year we actually took the third benchmark with close to 11% of our students being proficient on the third benchmark. While these gains are not gargantuan by any means, these small millimeters that we have inched forward in this past year represent significant culture change and expectations from teachers and students alike around the building. Straight to the point, across the building, we are focusing on academic vocabulary and using the UACID format uh, to structure our daily lessons and units around a central idea that allows students and teachers to identify the skills, practice the skills, communicate the skills, and extend the use of that skill to other, area, to other areas within their school learning and within their lives. The structures that have been put in place at our school to ensure planning and preparation have been vital to the student's success. As we continue to refine what we're doing, what works, is shared with other teachers and then reproduced in other classrooms. A major difference between last year, there's much more collaboration between teachers in the content areas. Our school journey last year was brimming with problems. It seemed like everything a teacher did to try to better their students was met with some type of conflict. It was a great deal of hostility. Laziness and neglect permeated every facet of our school culture. In truth, by the end of last year, I was ready to quit. Loved the kids, didn't have the right environment to teach in. Because I love my students, I chose to resolve myself to coming back and being in a position where I was gonna work alone, in isolation, feeling like an island, and I was gonna have to do that to make sure my students were successful. Fortunately, we had some shifts, some changes around our school, and that did not happen. When we came back this year, our school year began with an expectation to teach by building relationships. We didn't have to start the first day by saying, hey, let's take a test, let's see where you are, I need to know how many math problems you can solve. We were expected to spend the first two weeks of our school year getting to know our students and then using those relationships to drive our classroom management. We were also given the freedom and opportunity to teach using project-based learning. The project-based learning we were able to use to teach provided opportunities for our students to learn how to communicate with each other, work towards a goal, and use the math that they were learning to actually explain something that was valuable to them. Uh, our students did go to Project Expo this year. We sent one group last year, seven groups this year, and five of our groups received some type of medal recognition, either bronze, silver, or gold, to receive participation awards. Last year, our group received one gold. One of the greatest assets teachers have received this year. <laughs> One of the greatest assets our teachers have received this year is the freedom to teach in the way they believe is effective, free from hostility and uniformity. Teachers are given the opportunity to explore unique ways to teach and opportunities to learn how to perfect their craft. What doesn't work is not used, and what does work is repeated. Given the opportunity to teach and support, and the support needed to perfect their craft, our students have had a more enriching academic experience. Watching our students strive towards excellence and working with staff members willing to grind constantly invigorates my joy of teaching on a daily basis and it's why we're having more success with our students at Joe. Mr. Irvin's coming back. <laughs> So one of the things that we talk about in L5 is having systems and structures in place to predict the future. 
One of the things that we're going to be doing at Jolton, we're going to be a data-driven school. Every single thing that we do is going to be based on data. What we've already started to do is talk about culture and climate for next year. How can we improve upon what we've already done? And you can see one of the big things is we're going to have a culture walkthrough, making sure everyone understands how do we have a positive culture on our campus. But most important, we're looking at curriculum instruction. And what we're going to do is something called a summer series. And with the summer series, we're going to focus on literacy and instructional planning. We're going to dig really deep into analyzing our lesson plans, making sure we have a deep understanding of you aced it, and digging into data to make sure we're continuing to improve our teaching. We're also going to do a book study looking at the latest and best practices. The administrators will read a book called The Flat World of Education, where we look at uh, we look at Finland, New Zealand, and Ontario, their best practices, so that we're implementing it at our school. Our classified staff will read a book called The Nordstrom's Way, which talks about customer service. And then our teachers will read a book called Data Wise, so that we have a real firm understanding of data. So as you can see, we're planning and predicting an even greater future. But I think what's really important is testimonies of our school. You heard from the teachers, but I think the most important clients are our students. And one of the things I try to do, I'm always asking the students, what can I do different as a teacher? So what I'm going to do, I'm going to have two of our eighth grade students come up, and they're going to give a testimony of what they've noticed at Jolton, because I think their voice is very important. So. My name is Kayla Laws. I go to Jolton Middle. My first year of Jolton Middle was seventh grade. It was very different from what I was used to. If you go in the classroom, there wasn't a lot of learning. The students were off task or either getting yelled at. But this year, I've noticed that students actually learn a lot. You can go in the classroom and actually ask a student what they're learning about, and they can clearly tell you that they're, what they're learning about and why it's important. There's been a very significant difference of the learning from eighth grade year to seventh grade year, and I can see it from last year to this year. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Zach Hoskins. I'm from Jolton, Tennessee. I have attended Jolton Middle for three years now. My first year at Jolton was sixth grade. Um, I come to Jolton thinking it was going to be a place for me to get to learn some more. I'm originally from Memphis, Tennessee, so the schools are kind of rough down there and it's just how it was at coming sixth grade and nothing really changed. I was thinking it's going to get better. Uh, you walk in the classroom and it's kind of just like uh, it's not really learning, it's more playing. Kids would think they get to get away with yelling at the teachers, disrespecting the teachers because the staff that we had was not putting their foot down to the students and giving them the uh, suspensions and giving them the uh, referrals that they needed. Uh, seventh grade, we had a different principal, had a principal different every year, had a different principal in seventh grade. Uh, it didn't really get no better. If, it, if anything, it got worse. Teachers was missing days. There was no learning going on in the classroom. But since I've been at Jolton, eighth grade year has drastically changed. Mr. Irving, principal, he has turned the whole school around. And I can tell you, the school, there's a lot more learning going on. The students are not disrespecting the teachers. Uh, we are getting the learning that we need. When you walk in the classroom, you kind of feel like it's more of a learning environment than it was just a kind of a playhouse. <laughs> wow. So in closing, you heard some of the uh, teachers' testimony. You heard some of the students. But I think if you look at this final testimony right there from Dr. Welch, she is the principal at Jolton Elementary School. And one of the first things I heard when I came to Jolton Middle School, we have to develop a relationship with her. And what we do, we have meetings every Monday 
halfway between our campuses when it's not too cold and <laughs> just talk about what's going on. But I think if you read her comments and it says, I'm very excited about the wonderful changes I see happening at Jolton Middle School. There has been a pronounced increase in community outreach because we're making sure the community knows what we're doing. Relationships with relationships and academic exception towards the students, as well as partnership now with Jolton Elementary School. Jolton Middle School is on the track to becoming not a good school, but a great school. Now, I tell our staff all the time, from the moment I set foot on campus, I don't want to be the best school in Metro. I don't want to be the best school in Tennessee. I want to be one of the nation's best school. I want people to think about Jolton Middle Prep, wonder where is this school at, and then they come and see what we're doing, and they're seeing some phenomenal things happening on our campus. So as you can see, I think we're doing some incredible things at Jordan, I mean at Jolton, and I think that we're going to continue, and this is just the beginning of some great things that happen in the future. Thank you very much. Mr. Irvin, you can come up and take a picture. Mr. Irvin, come on back. Bring the kids, take a picture. <laughs> Next, we will move along to public participation. Um, each uh, speaker gets three minutes um, to state their, their case. Um, you will hear, hear a bell at the end of three minutes. There you go. And we respectfully ask you to um, let the next person speak. Uh, and we will also be displaying the names on the monitor. So if you could line up in that order to expedite uh, this process, we would really appreciate it. First up is um, Mr. Eric Huth. Dr. Eric Huth. Good evening, Mrs. Shepard, Dr. Joseph, and members of the Board of Education. I'm Dr. Eric Huth, President of the Metropolitan National Education Association, which is located at 531 Fairground Court. MNEA is a member of Nashville Organized for Action and Hope, or NOAA, which is an interfaith, multiracial social justice organization that addresses issues impacting our community. I am joined this evening by members of NOAA's Criminal Justice Task Task Force, which has been working on the issue of racial disparities in school discipline in MMPS. The minutes of your December 8, 2015 meeting reflect the creation of a disciplinaries a disparity disciplinary disparity committee, excuse me, and the appointment of Dr. Joanne Brownin as Brannon as chair and Amy Frogue as a committee member. At that time, you also asked Dr. Tony Majors to, quote, work with the committee. In the spring of last year, NOAA sought the explicit support of each member of this board and received confirmation that eight of the nine members were willing to both work with NOAA and support the work of the committee. <coughs> After meeting only once on April 7, 2012, the Equity and Schools Discipline Committee Committee's work was placed on the back burner in favor of the search that led to the hiring of Dr. Joseph as superintendent. Nonetheless, in June and July, five of you were running for school board and reassured us of your support for the committee and our work. For, for that, we are truly thankful. 
However, this fall, Thais Hunter, Hunter was named as chair of the committee, but recently told us that she had no intention of, of reconvening, excuse me, of reconvening the committee and apparently indicated that no one wants to be bothered with NOAA, end quote. The result of this is that no meeting of the committee has been held since the school board election. My purpose here this evening is to call on each of you to support our efforts to reduce the racial disparities in discipline and appoint a chair to the committee and ask you to re-engage with our community within the next 30 days. We are aware that while overall suspension rates in MMPS are down, racial disparities appear to be remaining constant. Unfortunately, many teachers report that the reduced number of suspensions may be the result of lack of enforcement. We're concerned that this may indicate that African American students continue to be treated differently than Caucasian students. Thank you for your time this evening, and we look forward to working with you to, the, to improve the equity gap in MMPS student disciplinary actions. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mr. Chris Moth. Uh, good evening, I'm, I'm Chris Moth, a very thankful parent of three kids of our MNPS zone schools in the Hillsborough cluster. And I want to correct the title and the agenda. It really should just be a, a, a shout out of thanks to the hard work of our transition team choice committee. Reducing flight is a goal we all share. Only one in nine of the fourth graders in our cluster arrive at Hillsborough High for ninth grade. For a decade, I've devoted a lot of energy to encouraging my neighbors to stay the course in MNPS. I recently chaired the Hillsborough Cluster Parent Advisory Council, and I had the pleasure of meeting with parent leaders from a lot of other clusters. From conversations and research, we learned that across Nashville, 40% of our children leave integrated zone schools after fourth grade. Sometimes the flight is to charter schools, which are segregated by application form part paperwork. Sometimes the flight is to academic magnets, which are segregated by test scores, and of course, trans Transportation, as you know, plays a hurdle and uh, plays a role in all this uh, this picture. We looked at Williamson County. Uh, Fairview cluster is one third poverty, but like the rest of Williamson County, enrollment per grade increases uh, at middle school. And as we are de debating creation of more choices here in Nashville, let's not forget that Williamson County, which offers no choice, uh, is adding our kids to their middle schools. I really want to thank Dr. Joseph for the very hard work of the Transition Team Choice Committee. Uh, they listened to our research very closely, and they embraced a couple of wonderful ideas that came from the Stratford Cluster. Uh, Stratford parents are an exciting new generation of thinkers, uh, and they're eager to embrace diversity and move our system forward in new ways. Stratford proposed allocation of academic magnet slots by cluster, and Stratford proposed automatic enrollment of all eligible children in the academic magnet lotteries. Allocating academic magnet slots by cluster would obviously reduce flight across the city. Enrolling all eligible children in the academic magnet lottery would restore some of the 1983 diversity goals that initially drove the courts to order creation of our academic magnets. But ultimately, to reduce flight, we have to shatter this myth that pervades Nashville. And the myth is that quality education demands segregated school buildings. Uh, and I think Stratford's two ideas, to allocate magnet slots by cluster, to enroll every child in the lottery, are exactly the right next steps towards shattering those old myths. Uh, Dr. Joseph, in your interview with us, the parent reps asked if you would uh, <coughs> open more of these score segregated academic magnets in light of the long waiting list. You joined every other candidate for your position with a clear no. But what really impressed me is that you bravely noted the schools who could become elitist in their construction, and you alone had the courage to ask why. And so I come here tonight to thank you for the hard work of that committee and to pray that you keep asking why as we work together on these issues. So in conclusion, please do everything in that committee report. It's a wonderful report. Uh, please keep listening to the new generations of families, especially Stratford Cluster. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Bob. I'm going to murder this name. Um, Ms. Takaloa? Nope. Okay, next on the list is Ms. Sylvia Holt. Good evening to the chair, um, to the board members, and also Dr. Joseph. 
My name is Sylvia Holt, and my address is 2925 Clay Mill Boulevard. I live in Nashville. I am a product of the early civil rights era, wherein my first 12 years of formal education was in a segregated public school system. They told us separate but equal, but I'm proof that that was not true. Um, my first through eighth grade was in a two-room school with a pot-bellied stove, no plumbing, one teacher for all grades. But despite that, we, uh, as students, we learned and we excelled. I graduated high school and waited 10 years before I decided to go to college. With a husband and three children by that time, it wasn't easy. But in 1977, I graduated, became a registered nurse. And also in 2010, I earned a degree in theology. I retired after 25 years at Baptist Hospital. And again in 2015, way past my retirement age, I retired again from the VA after 12 and a half years. My dream of becoming a published author was realized last year in July. My first book came out. It is a um, Christian memoir title between the pews. But with all of those accomplishments and dreams that I had for myself, I still know that there is more for me to do. One day while I was online, I came across a Nashville Rise training regarding the ASD school systems and the priority school system. I learned that the achievement school district and the priority schools, that priority schools could be looked at as modern day segregation. Immediately, I knew that's where I needed to be. So I joined Nashville Rise. After learning more about it, I hope that I can encourage, that I can inform and empower other people and engage them in conversation about our public school system. I believe that every child deserves the best opportunity to succeed in life. So I ask that the board and everyone here today would join with us as we advocate to increase access for high level educational options for all of our children, no matter what their race and no matter what their zip code is. Thank you, Ms. Hall. Thank you. Angelica Cooks Lucas. Ms. Lucas. Laura Benton. Good evening, Chair, members of the board, and Dr. Joseph. My name is Laura Benton. I live in Bellevue. I've been teaching elementary music in Metro for 17 years. The last 12 have been at Cockrell Elementary School in West Nashville. I'd like to begin by thanking you for sending the recent school climate survey. A thorough and truly anonymous survey of our working conditions has been long overdue. Thank you for giving us a voice. As an elementary school teacher, I am grateful for the research-supported state recess law and pleased to see that it has been revised so that every elementary and middle school should be able to implement it more feasibly next year than we have been able to do this year. Due to the rather broad wording of the revised law, along with some concerns I received from colleagues teaching at various metro schools, I would respectfully ask that you create some basic guidelines for next year's recess time so that it is protected as unstructured physical activity as was intended in the law. We all feel the extreme importance of closing achievement gaps, but we must not let that stop us from giving children the physical and mental breaks they need throughout the day in order to be successful in school. And I would add that from the earlier meeting that you all had talking about possibly extending the calendar, um, if we could just regard the summer slide you were discussing earlier, 
perhaps you might consider moving the schools that were once referred to as enhanced option, those elementary schools such as mine, from the extended day, which is extremely long for young children, back to the more extended calendar where we went into the summer, where we would have much less of a slide. Lastly, a non-tenured teacher who wishes to remain anonymous would like to address student discipline. Despite our codified student handbook and specific guidelines for student interventions and or disciplines, student behaviors are not being dealt with according to those guidelines in some of our schools. As a result, student misbehavior, including behavior harmful to other students and or teachers, is being underreported. Thank you for your time. Ms. Rosemary Wade. Rosemary Wade, Crawford Middle School, Visual Arts. Good evening, Dr. Joseph and school board members, fellow teachers and NPS workers. Thank you first to Nola Jones for her vision and push for us to implement the Gladys Art Portfolio Project. Many states commend our work. Our students are producing incredible works of art, in part due to the rigor of this Gladys project. Greater opportunities to showcase the district-wide artists would include challenge, encourage and grow the student portfolios, and deepen the art community spirit of MNPS within the city of Nashville. Artwork selected for Dr. Joseph's office was encouraging and seemed to spark some of this creativity. I suggest that building wide grade and student showcasing has already been being done. I would suggest that aligning these showcases with the city of Nashville's art crawl each month and announcing our alignment and inviting media parents and families to visit those buildings. Community outreaches with buildings, I'm sorry, with businesses, health clinics, government company, uh, companies, and the zoo have all been requested from me and myself for our own artwork. We have created t-shirts, water bill refill station covers, health posters. We have are in administration offices throughout the district. Pencil partnerships for project-based learning opportunities with real life art projects. Teacher student art shows, teacher art shows, Many students are requesting a, a summer visual arts program or camp for promotion of further individualized growth opportunities. Many talented artists have helped behavior and boost self-esteem, also helped them practice as student teachers mentoring their, their fellow students. I suggest the integration of ELA and math with my own art really prove greatest growth with English language learners. But overall growth throughout the integration initiative was advantageous with writing, reading, and scale. Integration of core subjects and character building are being implemented with visual art practices at my school helping behavior issues with students. Please consider this request as new ideas emerge to improve our district in visual arts. A lot of the art programs in the summer are costly and some of these students are simply not able to attend. Please consider professional development for grant writing for visual arts teachers to keep costs low, organize ourselves, and make art teachers all become a team. Thank you, Will Pinkston, for all you've done for our school. It was great news what I heard about Croft Middle tonight, and thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Beverly Whalen. Good evening, Chair, members of the board, and Dr. Joseph. My name is Beverly Whalen Schmeller, and I live at 1010 15th Avenue South. I have lived in town for 17 years, and I have worked as a school psychologist here for 11 years. I want to talk about our paraprofessionals in special education, also known as exceptional education in our district. My comments are directly linked to our goal of recruiting and retaining excellent people. Paraprofessionals are aides who help the neediest students with IEPs, whether it is by helping students stay on task because they experience ADHD or brain injuries, or by helping students in wheelchairs navigate hallways and bathrooms. Paraprofessionals are dedicated individuals who help all of our students succeed. They work in every kind of school in Metro, from Hume Fogg to Harris Hillman. 
I propose that we consider increasing their wage and hiring more of them for the following reasons. One, like teachers, these people love children and consider their jobs a calling. They work hard, they have college degrees in many instances. We should acknowledge their dedication. Two, they help the most vulnerable students we have in person every day. Three, they do not make a living wage. For example, my friend who has been a paraprofessional for nine years makes $17,000 a year. Most parapros have to work two to three jobs to support their families. We might not have 68 vacancies for these jobs if we offered a living wage. Four, they become teachers. I personally know several people who have started as paraprofessionals who have decided to get teaching degrees. Five, paraprofessionals help all students by going into regular education classrooms. The students with the IEP then get taught in the least restrictive environment with the content teacher who is the expert. With a parapro present, the teacher can keep teaching all of the students and the parapro is another model of appropriate adult behavior in the class. Six, we need to be competitive. Nashville has become a hub and we want to attract smart, positive people to work with our students. We need to focus forward, we need these people, and we need these people to stay in Metro. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Kamala Brandt. Hi, good evening, Chair, members of the board, and Dr. Joseph. My name is Marlo Brandt, and I teach at Glencliff High School. Um, I am here tonight to offer thanks and address some concerns I have regarding online testing. First, thank you for granting me my tenure last month. Um, and I also want to thank you for recognizing the need to take 10 Ready testing this year on pencil and paper. I have no doubt that you came to that decision after witnessing the various issues surrounding the online testing platform and servers last year. These problems are not exclusive to the 10 Ready test. Students face network errors and server errors on other required online testing, most recently the access test for ELL students. <laughs> But the technology problem runs much deeper than not having enough servers, bandwidth, or even computers. The problem is that while we think that we are assessing our students' math and reading abilities, we're actually testing their computer literacy. Is computer literacy important in today's world? Absolutely. However, we need to make sure that we are setting our students up for success before throwing them into online testing with little support. Many of our students do not have access to computers at home, and many of our ELL population have had interrupted schooling or have been in refugee camps with no technology. Their very basic computer skills are lacking. We have students who came new to the United States in February who struggle even pushing Control-Alt-Delete to log into the computer. Yet on online tests, we expect them to be able to use the mouse to drag a test answer into a square or drag numbers across a number line. While general education teachers do teach our students how to log into the computer and how to use the computer for our own class purposes, the students really need a class to teach them basic computer skills such as typing, saving documents, using email, sending attachments, etc. When I taught middle school in this district, there were no required computer classes for students. There was only a class as an elective, so only some students took computer class. Now I teach high school, and while we do have a web design class, we also have no required basic computer class or even an elective. Um, I come to you with two requests. One, please do your best to ensure that required standardized assessments are truly testing what they say they are testing. I believe the decision to take 10 Ready on paper this year is a step in the right direction um, regarding test validity. And two, please consider the district's need for computer literacy classes. We want to pride ourselves on producing 21st century graduates, but we are missing foundational classes to set, up, set them up for 21st century success. Thank you for listening and for your consideration. Thank you. Ms. Amanda Kale. Good evening, Dr. Joseph and ladies and gentlemen of the board. My name is Amanda Kale. I'm an EL teacher at Margaret Allen Middle Prep. My address is 605 Rudolph Avenue, Nashville, Tennessee. Um, in the interest of time and uh, after having listened to so many things this evening, I'm going to skip all the stuff that I just that I wrote and I'm going to be very, very brief. 
um, because I know you're a busy people. So um, I just want to say, sitting here tonight, I I started making a list of all of the problems that I heard people talk about. Um, For example, um, the disruption and churn created by school choice, disparities in achievement, disparities in discipline, teachers feeling like they don't have enough resources to really help their students. And then I started listening to the things people were saying were working and were helping. Um, Restorative justice, community involvement, a curriculum that engages and pushes students to grow. Um, And I I wanna sort of call attention to that because there is a program that I recently learned about that really brings all of those things together. And I think it's amazing. Um, It is the transformative school, community schools model, and I've just handed you a handout about it. Um, But one of the things that I love so much about this is that this is not a package. It's not community schools in capital letters with a TM after it. It is something that allows each school to serve the needs of the the people that it serves. Um, And I I hope that you can um, look into this a little further. I know we already have the Community Achieves program. This builds on that, and I think it does some really incredible work. And I want to just call your attention to just a very few things that are on this handout. Um, First of all, a community school uh, provides an array of student-centered opportunities, programs, supports, and services to enhance conditions for high-quality teaching and learning. This is not only restorative justice and wraparound support services like we currently have, but a really deep community engagement model. Um, And I want to just point out a few of the outcomes of schools that have decided to do this. Um, First of all, Benjamin Franklin High School um, in 2010, 21% of students were proficient in math. In 2014, 71 were proficient with no rezone, no change in neighborhood feeder schools. Um, Prince Hill in Cincinnati, in 2006, 85% of their students were dropping out. In 2016, 62% were being accepted to college. Um, This is amazing transformative work. But I want to point out one last thing. It takes time. And I know that in education, we always have a flavor of the month. And so I hope that we can hold on to community schools and really bring these things that we have now that are working. Thanks. Dr. Joseph and members of the board. My name is Jenny Petula and I teach at Glencliff Elementary School. Um, I'd like to thank you tonight for prioritizing the safety of our immigrant students. Uh, Dr. Joseph's December statement affirming schools as welcoming to all students sent the right message and thank you for that. As teachers of immigrant students, we appreciate your commitment to protecting all students and ensuring that schools remain a safe place for all to learn and thrive. Metro Nashville Educators Association has thrown its full support behind these kids whose futures suddenly feel so uncertain. MNEA has partnered with an organization called Nashville Community Defense to support children and families whose safety is threatened by the possibility of Immigration and Customs Enforcement, or ICE raids. We know that keeping schools safe for these students is of the utmost importance. With your commitment, schools can remain safe and secure learning environments. However, at the end of the day, these students still worry about the possibility of finding their loved ones missing from home. It might seem like there's not much that we can do about that, but tonight I want to ask you to consider how to best plan ahead for students who may suddenly find themselves alone without parents or guardians due to ICE activity. While we dread this possibility, we are urging you to work with us to create safety plans that could alleviate some of the inevitable trauma that would come from losing a parent to detention or deportation. Some ways that the district could support these students include providing a safe place for students to wait if a parent parent or sibling has been detained, collaborating with community organizations to find ways to meet a child's immediate needs and prevent them from entering foster care, and providing counseling for students who have had a family member detained. Some school districts have begun to prepare by sending forms to all parents asking for clarification on who will care for their children temporarily in the event of family separation. So that's one small step we could go ahead and take as a district. While none of us want our students to lose their families or their homes, our schools can and should play a critical role in supporting students who may experience such losses. We thank you for your support, and we encourage you to join us in taking proactive action to protect all our students. Thank you.
Good afternoon. My name is Lupita Chavez. I'm a parent at Cameron. Thank you for inviting me to speak today on a subject that is so clear and imperative to our children's future. Education gives knowledge, and knowledge gives them opportunities to make their li lives to be the best way can be in a society that is built on a progression. Our goal is to raise and educate the best students we possibly can. We have done that together with Cameron through the leadership of leader public schools. I have one daughter that went to Cameron that is now excelling at MLK. I have another daughter in the seventh grade at Cameron. She will be traveling to New York this weekend to compete with Cameron's government club. I have another daughter that will be going to Cameron next year. Our parent leadership team loves Cameron and lead public schools. We want to make sure this historic building receives the care and funds necessary. Please consider our building to improvements. There are great, great things going on inside. Thank you. Thank you. Jeremy Jones. Fanny Jones was next. Yeah, Fanny Jones is not here. She's okay. stuck at work. All right. Buenas tardes. Mi nombre es Alma Gramajo. Um, good afternoon. My name is Alma Gramajo. Soy madre de cinco hijos. I'm mother of five children. Uno de 19. One's 19. Una de 13. One's 13. Una de 10. One's 10. Uno de 8. One's 8. Y uno de 2. And one's 2. Eh, somos una familia muy unida. We're a family very united. Mi hija Margie asiste a Cameron. My daughter Margie goes to Cameron. Desde hace un año. She has one year there. Ella vino de Guatemala. She came straight from Guatemala. Cuando ella llegó a Cameron. When she came to Cameron. Uh, tuvo que aprender inglés. She had to learn English. Y adaptarse a todo lo que aquí se aprende. And adapt to everything that you learn here. Pero hoy en día, and today, gracias a Dios y a los maestros, thank you to God and her teachers, y al esfuerzo que ella le, le pone para estudiar, and everything she did to study, um, ya sabe inglés, she now knows English, y gracias al, a la ayuda que le dan los maestros, and thankful, thankfully for the help that the teachers give, eh, va bien avanzada. She's very much advancing. Y tiene muy buenas calificaciones. And she's got great grades. Por esa razón. For this reason. A mí como madre. Um, myself as a mother. Y como miembro del grupo de padres de, de liderazgo. And as a member of our parent leadership council at Cameron. Nos gustaría we would que like la escuela. That the school. Recibiera más ayudas. That the school receives more help para mejorar las instalaciones to help with the building and del, del edificio and the, and the, yeah, and the building sorry go on para que los estudiantes se sientan seguros so that the students feel safe y que aprendan cosas nuevas and they can learn new things les agradezco mucho por escucharme thank you very much for listening thank you Carmen Cantonega and um Carmen is sick to me. Okay. Um, Ms. Rita Pfeiffer? The school board and Dr. Joseph. My name is Rita Pfeiffer, and the next two speakers, Megan Kappelman um, and Abby Leofsky, and I are master students in the speech language pathology program at Vanderbilt University. And this evening, our talks will be connected to each other. For, because of that, you can reach all of us at the same address. 1215 21st Avenue South, room 8310, Nashville, Tennessee, 37232. For your convenience, we will email you the contact information directly. At the end of January, I reached out to you on behalf of the Vanderbilt chapter of the National Student Speech Language and Hearing Association because we know that you care about the quality of learning for the students of MNPS. We care as well and have enjoyed our time providing speech language therapy to MNPS students with a wide variety of communication needs in several schools during our clinical training. We have witnessed how an effective learning environment can make all the difference in children achieving academic success. 
With regards to classroom effectiveness, people commonly think about a variety of different factors, such as how the teacher delivers a given lesson, as we talked about earlier, the you know, the school environment and the culture. But what if we told you that part of an effective learning environment could be with something as simple as the classroom acoustics? <laughs> classroom acoustics refer to the sound environment in a classroom, specifically how well a given sound signal, such as a teacher's voice, can be projected into the classroom above the present level of noise. Classroom acoustics play an important and sometimes overlooked role in the educational environment. Everyday classroom materials, such as background noise, high reverberation caused by common classroom materials, and distance between students and teachers can cause students to miss what is being said during crucial learning time. We recognize that classrooms can be busy places, so of course, classrooms can, will be noisy at times. Under these noisy condi conditions, good classroom acoustics can make the difference in students being able to hear their teacher. Unfortunately, because it is not formally regulated by the government, the vast majority of classrooms in the nation do not meet the national standards for good classroom acoustics. You may be rightfully thinking, well, if the classroom is noisy, why can't the teacher just talk louder? Um, well, the problem is that teaching is a profession where you constantly have to use your voice. And more so than similar professions, teachers are more likely to have voice disorders. Research has found that in the United States, 58% of teachers will have a voice disorder sometime in their career, compared to 29% for non-teachers. Voice disorders are painful and frustrating occupational hazards, causing teachers to have more sick days or worse, take a leave of absence. By improving classroom acoustics, we would help reduce the degree to which teachers would need to overextend their voices, thereby benefiting both teachers and students. Megan will now come to better illustrate the real life impact of how classroom acoustics can influence student learning and academic success. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Good evening, Chair, members of the board, and Dr. Joseph. My name is Megan, and I'm also a Vanderbilt graduate student. Both students with typical hearing and their peers with hearing loss are impacted negatively by the effects of poor classroom acoustics. Children with a hearing loss, those with learning disabilities, speakers of another language, those with a speech and language delay, or those with attention difficulties are all at an increased risk for negative effects of poor classroom acoustics. There are many effects on learning because of a poor acoustic environment. In noisy and or reverberant classrooms, the least effects are seen when students are involved in practicing skills they already know, like math drill problems. The greatest effect is seen when students are introduced to a new topic or words or concepts. The noise not only affects their rate of learning, but it also affects children's persistence. Children who are educated in noisy classrooms tend to give up faster when faced with learning challenges. This lack of perseverance is a serious limitation to a healthy learning attitude and our current need to be accountable for every child's school achievement. Acoustic environment also affects Achievement. It is not surprising that students in schools next to noisy freeways can have a one-year drop in grade equivalent achievement scores for every 10 decibel increase in traffic noise in the classroom. The energy needed to listen more carefully leaves less mental capacity to process the information that is being presented, and it saps the length of time that students can truly absorb information. Noisy classrooms tend to be wigglier and require more repetition than classrooms where children do not have to put as much listening effort in. Non-auditory tasks such as short-term memory, reading, and writing are also impaired by noise. All of these negative effects on learning due to poor acoustics in classrooms also have the potential to affect assessment outcomes for children and schools in general. Noisy classrooms can affect the actual test-taking environment, but they will also affect children's learning prior to the assessment. We're now going to play some audio clips to simulate what the degrees of hearing loss sound like. For this, we'll get some help from our friends, the Flintstones. <laughs> One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Aha! Uh -huh. You're on my apartment building on Granite Avenue. You owe me 300 bucks. Get Mild. Fred, take it easy. It's only a game. Well, Ma, I'm just like them big tycoons. I play to win. Now, Barney, pay up or get out of the game. Moderate. One ball and two to go. Ready to go, Barney? Severe. As you can hear from those clips that demonstrate the different levels of hearing loss, now imagine having a hearing loss and trying to learn with typical environmental noise playing constantly in the background.
Now, think about a noisy classroom during group activities or free time. Now that we've gone over some of the effects of poor classroom acoustics and how they affect all children, Abby's going to highlight how interventions can help children and discuss some simple ways to start to improve classroom acoustics. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Good evening, Chair, members of the board, and Dr. Joseph. My name is Abby, and I'm also a Vanderbilt graduate student. Good classroom acoustics greatly facilitate learning. With good classroom acoustics, learning is easier, deeper, more sustained, and less stressful. Good classroom acoustics and good acoustical design enhance speech clarity and limits background noise to protect speech quality for both students and teachers. So now knowing what the impact of the acoustic classroom has on students, especially those with disabilities or delays, how can we improve classroom acoustics? There are a variety of modifications that can be implemented into your current school classrooms. FM systems are a popular and effective tool to use in the classroom. These assistive listening devices help students and teachers by amplifying the teacher's voice through a wireless microphone and loudspeakers in the room. This amplification is extremely beneficial as it reduces the distractions and increases understanding of speech all around the classroom. It's been shown to improve students' attention to task and overall decreases the listening effort. It also reduces vocal strain for the teachers who are using it. When we look at the literature, there's an abundance of research supporting FM systems as research has shown a correlation between the use of FM systems and increased student test scores. Additionally, strategies for reducing noise include installing carpet in classrooms to absorb those high frequency sounds and dampen noise from students and from movement in the classroom, from the classroom furniture. Acoustic ceiling tiles are another valuable modification that can be installed into classroom ceilings to absorb sound and maximize the quality of sound produced in the area where these tiles are installed. In addition to these more costly solutions, there are other cheaper methods that teachers can use to provide good, good acoustics as speech clarity is very dependent on the architectural design of a classroom, including the size, the shape, and the surface treatments. These considerations could include putting rubber feet on the bottoms of chairs, adding shades to windows, or even putting students' artwork on the walls. I understand that this is a lot to consider, and we're happy to come in and collaborate with the schools to make this possible. Dr. Joseph, I know that you host the weekly principal meetings, and if possible, we would be happy to talk with these principals directly um, to discuss these cost-effective solutions. Uh, we know that the quality of learning for the students of Metro is of the utmost importance to you, and it's a priority for us as well. As we've discussed, not only this, as we've discussed, not only the students that we have served, but all students of Metro can be affected by poor classroom acoustics. And we believe that MS, MNPS can be a leader for the nation in making classroom acoustics and hearing health in the education a priority. Uh, thank you for your time and interest, and we look forward to working with you in the future. Thank you. Move on to governance issues, and we'll start with the consent agenda. Ms. Spearing. Thank you, Madam Chair. 1A, recommended approval of supplement number two for professional services for facility conditions assessment and master planning services, MGT Consulting of America Incorporated. B, awarding of purchases and contracts. One, music and art. Two, Taylor Music, Inc. Three, Tennessee Filter Sales, Inc. And C, approval of the 2017 CTE textbook adoptions. Madam Chair, I move to approve the consent agenda as read. Can I get a second? Second. Okay, all in favor? Thank you, Ms. Berry. Um, we'll move on to item number two under on governance issues, um, student appeal, student discipline appeal, Kane Ridge High School, Ms. Harkin. Good evening, everyone. Um, as you know, there are two student discipline appeals on your agenda tonight. Uh, I'm here to kind of walk you through the legal process. Luckily, these don't come up uh, very often, so I want to make sure that you know what you are being asked to do tonight. Um, this is kind of the legal process for both of them, and then obviously if you have questions, please, please let me know. Um, specifically, what happens is uh, tonight, 
you are being asked to look at these two student appeals and decide whether or not you need a hearing is kind of the first thing. And then if you do not need a hearing, um, you can go ahead and make a decision based on the review of the record, um, or you can ask to have the hearing and have a greater conversation as part of that hearing. Specifically, both the policy, the MNPS policy, follows almost exclusive right out of the, the text of the law. So I'm just going to read to you the very short per portion of the law in terms of what is before you tonight. Uh, so if there is an appeal, basically the Board of Education, based upon a review of the record, and I do believe that everybody received the records for both of these cases, you may grant or deny a request for a board hearing and may affirm or overturn the decision of the hearing authority with or without a hearing before the board. So again, as I explained, it's, it's really, this is your opportunity after reviewing the record for both of these. If you're ready to make a decision on that review of the record, you can go ahead and do that without granting a hearing. Or if you want to have a hearing, you can certainly ask to do that. Um, again, the idea is, since we are part of a public open meeting, um, that we would not be discussing very specific information related to these students. Certainly, if you need to reference them, refer to them as, you know, the student. Um, and uh, again, if further discussion is needed, that would be more likely to, to come as part of a hearing. So the first thing you said was grant or deny. What was the rest of that statement? So, so be, from, the, from the TCA provision, so you may grant or deny a request for a board hearing. <coughs> and may affirm or overturn the decision of the hearing off authority with or without a hearing before the board. So again, the way that I read that is if you decide that you need a hearing, you can certainly just ask for the hearing and we would have that after a you know, future board meeting. Or if based on the review of the record, if you are ready to make a decision to either uphold what has happened before or overturn what has happened at the lower levels, you can do that as well with or without a hearing. We need a motion? Yes, on, and if you can take each of them separately. Right. All right, so on, for instance, on the student discipline um, appeal from Cambridge High School, then we need a motion to grant or deny a request for a hearing first, yay or nay, and then we need to affirm or overturn the, the decision, yay or nay, correct? If you grant the hearing, right. you would not do We'd anything We would not need the yeah. rest, okay, yeah. all right, I got that, okay. So on student appeal um, for Cambridge High School, can I get a motion to grant or deny a request for a hearing on this case? I make a motion to grant uh, a hearing for an appeal. Do I have a second? I do not have a second, so the motion fails. Can I get a uh, motion to deny a request for a hearing? No motion, all right. So then moving on to, can I get a motion to um, either affirm or overturn the decision? Uh, we gotta do something here, guys. I, I, I move to uphold the decision of the lower levels in this case. Okay, can I get a second on that? Okay, it's been motioned and seconded. Can we have any discussion? Mr. Pink. I haven't had a chance to review the record. I'm going to be abstaining uh, for these votes. Any other discussion? Can I get a vote to um, uphold the decision on uh, student appeal from Cambridge High School? Yay. Opposed. Motion passes. Did you get the vote? Did you get the vote? Okay. Yeah, those who have voted to uphold the, the motion, please raise your hand. Thank you. Five, yes, okay. So on- Is that five or four? Five, five. With one abstain and one absent. Uh, mm -hmm. Okay. My apologies. All right, so student discipline uh, appeal for East Nashville Magnet High. Can I get a motion to grant or deny a request for a hearing? I motion that we um, we accept the request for an appeal hearing. Can I get a second? No second. All right. Motion fails. Can I get a uh, motion to confirm or overturn the decision for the East Nashville Magnet Student Discipline Appeal? Ms. Perry. 
Uh, I move to uphold the decision of the uh, committee. Can I get a second? Okay. Ms. Proof, second it. Any discussion? I have a little bit of a discussion. Um, I know these were, this was just lots of, lots of pages of student reports, adult reports, uh, police reports, and for both of them, there were some conflict, but for East especially, there was a lot of conflicting information. Um, there was one police report, then there was another police report, then there were conflicting um, student and witness testimonies that um, I just thought would warrant an appeal for expulsion. Um, when I think about students and their lives and being put out of school and the different learning environments that come after that, I just would want to hear more. And Dr. I have Gentry. a question, and may I pose a question to Ms. Harkey? Please do. Ms. Harkey, maybe I'm dreaming this, but in the past we've had executive sessions or at least sessions, closed door sessions, to allow uh, the board not to discuss or deliberate, but to ask questions for clarification of the information that was presented to us. Is there a reason why we were not allowed to do that this time? I'm not aware of us having executive, these don't come up very often, I will say that. Um, I am the, the one previous student discipline appeal that I was part of, I, I don't think we had an executive session. I don't know if that happened previously. Am I imagining that? I think it was something else. But I mean, I remember us looking at, am I, help me out here. So, so let me uh, also. We have done it because I remember us having redact, we've had copies of materials that have been redacted. They've been numbered. They've been collected back up. I mean, we've had opportunities to get clarity of the information that's been presented to us. And so, I'm, and, I mean, I've never had a vote that feels like this one feels, that we're blindly making a decision about uh, students' lives without having an opportunity to get some legal, I mean, we've been given documentation that has police reports in it and legal um, explanations of, of, of decisions that have been made, and we have no, inf no opportunity to get clarification about that, that information. It just doesn't feel complete. Right. I've never been comfortable being a part of this process, let me go on record as saying that, but it, this feels more throwing a dart at a board with a blindfold than anything we've ever done. Um, I, I guess two things. I am certainly available to answer any questions, and if, we, if there's a request to take this and have it on the next agenda for discussion, we can certainly do that. Um, but in terms of an executive session, executive sessions are, are they are for, an opportunity to ask the questions about pending or potentially pending litigation. This, to me, does not fall under that. Um, it would not be a proper use of an executive session. With that said, though, I'm certainly available to answer questions about the legal process as part of the public meeting, um, or as board members have specific legal questions about the cases, I, am, I can certainly make myself self available as much as I need to. But in terms of the meeting itself and what you are doing here, um, if you're, the way I interpret the law is if you're feeling like there needs to be a greater discussion or you have questions about the record, then that is where that hearing is your opportunity to really have that discussion, to ask those questions both of the parent or student asking for the hearing, as well as the principal and school would be there to, to hopefully answer those questions. I have a question. So the last one we had of this, then that was a hearing because they appeared before us. You granted at the first time that it was on the, the agenda, you granted a hearing, and so then we scheduled a hearing to occur okay. after a subsequent That's board the one meeting. I was remembering. Yes. Okay. But, all right. So, yeah, that's probably what you're remembering, right? Mm -mm. No? Okay. I'm remembering, help me out, Camille, quit not, I don't mean mouth. <laughs> Sitting in that back room with, and it must have predated you, someone allowing us to ask questions okay. about the materials that it were presented to us. Okay. Yeah, so I, I, yeah. maybe we were wrong then, but again, this just feels very blind. and. I mean, I don't know if you want to take, if the process is to just take questions for clarification from nine different people uh, at nine different occasions, if that's what helps, but I don't know that there is a sense of comfort 
um, right. here. So that's the thing I think. So I'm let me ask you: Can I ask you a legal opinion? Then, do you, um, as a lawyer, feel like that this person, this particular student, um, was um, given? Every what's the legal terminology for it was given the due process, due process right? So I'm not going to wade in into my opinion, but I can talk about the legal process. I mean, what I can say is that there has been a process up to this point. You are the next step. You're the level three as part of this review process. Obviously, if the board is feeling uncomfortable with the decision or they feel that there needs to be, after you've reviewed the record, if you still don't feel comfortable with what has happened previously, that is the opportunity to grant a hearing so that you can hear from both sides, ask those questions, have some more debate as part of a closed hearing outside of a board meeting. Okay. So I'm feeling a lot of unrest. Um, we do have a motion on the floor. Um, we do have to uh, make a decision on the motion, and the motion was to um, affirm the decision. We could have that motion and then go back if y'all want to, to see if we do, do want to grant a hearing. Well, before we do that, can I ask some more questions just yeah. about the process? Because I think the thing that I'm most unclear about is where these students stand now and what exactly they're appealing. Are they appealing the the um, the time frame that they were already suspended or expelled, and now that period is passed and they're back in school? Just where are the students now and what exactly are they appealing? Because I, I know all of this goes on record in their permanent record, but is that something that they're appealing to have that removed or what? I, under the law, what they can be appealing or what they are appealing or what you are being asked to decide is whether to uphold what has happened previously or to overturn it. Obviously, their individual appeal requests are asking for different things. Um, I, uh, I mean, for student number two. For, for student number two at East, it looks like there were specific requests that the family is requesting certain things be amended in the record. Okay, can you say that again? So, I, so, I mean, it I'm looks, sorry to put you on the spot. That's just, okay, and I, um, They're asking for the discipline record to be amended to state certain things. That's what they've specifically so put record. into okay. their request. Um, again, under the legal process, and, and I don't, under the legal process, I think what the board is being asked, either grant a hearing or not, but if you're ready to rule on it after the review of the record, you can uphold what has happened previously or overturn it. And I think that can run the gamut in terms of what you guys can do in terms of overturning. Um, the board can make the decision that there should never have been discipline instituted in the first place and this should be wiped from the record. Or you could do anything in the interim. You know, you could shorten the suspension time or um, change the record completely. I mean, I, I think that is really, this is open to the board to make the decision to either uphold what's happened previously or overturn it. Obviously, there has been some specific requests from the person asking for the appeal. Um, and based on your review of the record, if you're wanting more information, that's where that hearing can be helpful. Um, but if you feel like what has already happened previously, is acceptable, then you can uphold what's already been done. Okay. Thank you. Bless you. Yes. In order to shorten the um, time of the expulsion, that would have to take place with a hearing. No. If based on the review of the record, if you feel like you have enough information to go ahead and, and make a decision, including things like uh, affirming or overturning the decision before, you can do that without a hearing. Again, the, the TCA provision says that after review of the record, you may grant or deny a request for a hearing, and you may affirm or overturn the decision of the hearing authority with or without a hearing before the board question would refer to the first one that I've already voted for, though. Thank you. All right. So if, if there is any way to, to return okay. to 
the there is a way to return. For it, you make the motion to do it again. There you go. Okay. If you voted for it, you can make the motion. Well, I, you can make a motion for reconsideration. But first, we would yeah. need to close <laughs> out the current motion. <laughs> yes. So uh, that was a lot I to would read. like but, to. But, but we have a motion yeah, on the floor. Yeah, we got to close out the current motion. motion on the floor. So the motion on the floor, to, just to restate, is to uphold the decision for uh, student appeal number two. So uh, we've been motion and seconded. So we've had discussion. So all in favor? Okay. Um, unopposed. Oh, I think the opposition wins. Four to three. Okay. So we have killed the motion to uphold the decision. So now we can go back and see. Let's stick to the second case. That's the what we are. Okay, so uh, we're the on one still on the second case. Yes. Yeah. We're on second case, so student appeal number two. So if we want to go back and talk about, who, where are my notes? Um, if we want to um, approve for a hearing, a grant yeah, or. Yeah, so nothing's been done on the student two. Number two, it's completely. So y'all can decide right. what you want to do. And, and again, uh, I just want to say one more time. It's based on review of the record. You have what's happened previously before you. Um, if uh, Reviewing that record, it's a decision as terms of whether you want to grant a hearing to hear more or whether you feel like based on the record you have enough to go ahead and make a decision to either affirm or overturn what's happened previously. Okay, so can I get a motion then to um, grant or deny a request for a hearing? A motion that we grant the request for a hearing. Can I get a second? Second. And discussion. Uh, may I put something on the table? Sure. Uh, would it be helpful, since everyone has not had the opportunity to read um, this, this case and this multitude of information that we have received, to postpone this <coughs> vote until um, next month uh, so that everyone will have that opportunity. It, it was pretty extensive. And it's also videos, uh, clips in the office. Uh, we were able to see one, um, but we were not able to have access to the second one. So those opportunities are also available. Um, anyway, just to think about. Okay, so we still have to vote on the motion on the floor um, to um, grant a, 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 a hearing. Correct. Close a motion, or if the right. person that made the motion wants to withdraw it, they can do that. But we have to close that motion right. one way. Exactly. Or the other. Well, I'll say this: I'm willing to withdraw the hearing to give everybody a chance because it was it was just bunches of pages of stuff, and a lot of it was just contradictory. So to have more time, I will okay. withdraw the so motion. You are withdrawing your mm -hmm. motion. Okay. Um, so we are at the point now. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, if we're in discussion still. Uh, Ms. Harkey, is, is there like a, a day that we can schedule a meeting just for any board member who wants to come and, and, and you or someone else step us through the information? And I know it has to be a public meeting, but, um, but that's probably going to be the most efficient way for those of us who either weren't able to uh, review the record before tonight or who might end up being confused by the multitude of information that's in front of us when we do review it. And it'd be nice to be able to review it, talk about it, ask questions you know and that'd be very helpful no FERPA is an issue but uh, yeah so the open meeting part that we can't do it because it is student records that's um why if there is a hearing it would be a closed hearing and so so for 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 protection of student records, I can't have it as an open meeting. The other problem is it can't be an executive session. However, I am, although I, I hate to offer myself up for nine different meetings, I, I think that that probably is the best way that this would need to happen, or I can do kind of an informational well, session to, well, to the board. Why couldn't we just close the meeting the way we do when the actual hearing has happened? The law specifically allows the hearing portion to be closed. Um, there's nothing that allows us to kind of close it or, or move into what what you are describing, what you're wanting as an executive session, which again, under the law, an executive session is really only to talk about pending litigation. Ms. Could, Pierce. Oh, sorry. Could part of the um, packets that we receive possibly have a, a summary? That, that Because I know we get one kind of lead-in page, yeah. but it, there was so much that it did. I mean, I think there's even been confusion, obviously, on the board table tonight of where a status of a student actually is. And so um, 
Whereas, you know, I'm going, oh, oh, that's, you know, I know where they are now. And so, but not everybody does, but it did take a very long block of time for me to get there. So that's if there could be idea. a summary sheet that. Yes, that I can definitely help prepare a summary sheet. And, I, and, and now that you say that, I believe that the last time we had one of these, that there was a summary at the front. So I don't know. Um, that might be very much part of the confusion. So I can definitely provide a summary that I can include as part of the packet um, for you guys as you're continuing with, with your with review. Possibly with notations of the, the specific pages because, I mean, they're the same testimony sometimes five and six times yeah. throughout the packet, about 140 pages. So it did. It, it took a, a very long time to get through both of them. Yes. But it's just if, if you could help us with that, I think that would make us all feel a little more prepared if Definitely we prepare so. a summary yes um this is just like one of many issues where state law is a blunt instrument that hamstrings us from doing our jobs so i just want to put a stake in the ground on this issue in general dr severe if you could help us communicate with tsba that we might seek a change in statute in the future to help us and probably other boards that are dealing with this, this stuff it's probably a one sentence change that I bet nobody would object to on either side of the political fence uh, to help us uh, cut and clean these issues in the future. Yeah, Thanks. Yeah, we do. <laughs> right. Yes, we do. More than one. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 yeah, we do. Um, yeah, thank so, you for this, uh, Ms. Hart. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, so the motion that Ms. Bugs made has been withdrawn. And so I am, um, we need, do we need a motion to delay the, the yes, okay. now the motion is to defer. Okay, I make defer. a motion. I'd like to move that we defer the decision on the two student discipline appeals, both Cane Ridge High School and East Nashville Magnet High School until each board member has had an opportunity to, con nope. Unfortunately, you Just can do it on the time. second one, and I'm then on we'll the have to go back, back and reconsider back. the first, first one, one if that's yeah. what you All right. Do. I, will, I move that we defer <laughs> the decision on the student discipline appeal for East Nashville Magnet High School. Can I get a second? Second. Second. Okay. Can I get in discussion? Third, Any more discussion? Anybody else want to talk about it? Can we have a vote? All in favor? Okay. So that takes care of student number two. Yeah. So now, if we do we want to go back to student number yes. one? Yes, I would. I, I would move uh, that uh, I withdraw my vote. Uh, so I, I make move, a motion uh, to reconsider. I, I move to reconsider student uh, discipline appeal from Cane Ridge. Second. Okay. okay. All right. Any so, so now as part of this, just for procedural purposes, you're going to vote on this, and this will just allow you to then make another motion in terms of what you want to do with that okay. one. Okay. Okay. Okay, so we have had a motion and a second. Do we have any more? Oh, okay. Ms. Oh, oh, okay. I, I thought any more discussion. Okay, so let's go ahead and vote on motion number one. Yay, okay. So now do we need a, a motion to decide? I move that we defer the decision on student discipline appeal for Cane Ridge High School. Second. Okay. All right. Any discussion? I just, well, thank you, Ms. Harkey, and I'm sorry to put everybody through this. I just think when we talk about student student records for sure and then student um, days in school, I do want to make sure that we are not just being flippant about it, but that we're really looking at the way it can impact them years and decades, you know, down the road. So thank you all. And I will certainly get a summary out. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, I'm sorry. So, we, gosh, I'm losing my place. So, can I, I yeah, show I hands? Okay. All right. Motion passes. Ooh, that was hard. That oh. was. <laughs> Thank you so, so much, everybody. That's hard. All right. Um, moving on to the uh, strategic plan elements, Dr. Joseph. Yes, I will I'll call Dr. Carlisle up uh, last night. Thank you for a very engaging. Uh, work session that we had and we walked through the last elements of our strategic plan. So Dr. Carlisle is going to talk us through the uh, next steps and, and get us caught up to where we are and what happens from here on this vote. Greetings, everyone. I, I know you missed me. Um, <laughs> Terribly. Uh, actually, what, what I have is, is between last night and today, uh, based on feedback, uh, we removed the health indicated, the student or school health index outcome to become a secondary measure or an implementation measure. So that is no longer one of the KPIs. Otherwise, there was tightening up or editing of things like possessives uh, and 
things, things, a couple of minor, minor edits, but they do not affect uh, the s structure of the goal statements, the strategy statements, or the measures. So the, the major change from last night is that we're moving the school health index outcome to a different position so that it's not a, a leading measure. At this point, I can run back through uh, the four goal statements. We uh, went over these last night. Uh, we have f four strategy statements affiliated with goal one. We have five KPIs affiliated with strategy one, three with strategy two, S2, excuse me, two with strategy S3, two with strategy S4, and then we have three strategy statements affiliated with goal two, one KPI associated with uh, strategy P1, three with strategy P2, three with strategy P3, uh, and uh, Cameo is handing out the most updated document. Um, then there are two strategy statements affiliated with goal three. Three KPIs affiliated with uh, the organization one strategy, one KPI associated with the organization two strategy, and then lastly, we had two strategies affiliated with or associated with goal four, uh, three KPIs associated with uh, C1 and two with C2. Uh, so with that quick run through, um, I just wanna make sure that if you have any questions or comments that we entertain those now, because I know that there, uh, this is an action item, so it's to move forward with a vote so that we can uh, move on to the next phase. Any questions um, or comments? Question. We were pretty thorough last night. You have something, Mr. Pinkson? Okay. Yeah. So I went back um, and looked at the document that we reviewed last night uh, against some of the previous notes that I had made um, and and submitted. And just want to say thank you for um, listening uh, and integrating as much of that as possible in places where it made sense. Um, I think. Uh, to Dr. Joseph, Dr. Carlisle, and the rest of the team, this is probably the most intentional work that's happened maybe in the history of the school board. Um, so it's very substantive and uh, it's very comprehensive. I just do want to draw on two things from um, the, from public participation tonight. Uh, one is, uh, as we were reminded by Noah, uh, several of us around this table did make a series of very specific commitments around restorative practices, and I know restorative practices are called out in the plan, but I think we need not lose sight of the commitments that, uh, that several of us have made and make sure that those kind of, that language continues to get massaged. Uh, when and how appropriate going forward. Um, and I don't know what that process would look like and if that's something, you know, we could just get a report back on as you guys continue to, mm -hmm. to um, sharpen your pencils on it. And then the second thing that did dawn on me, um, after uh, seeing Ms. Kale um, speak tonight, um, who I think I've said before is one of my personal heroes, one of our strongest teacher voices, um, the commitment and I think the growing um, interest in the community schools model. Uh, and, and is that, called out or embedded in this somewhere that's easily discernible, and if not, should it be or could it be in the future? It isn't currently. It could be in hi highlighted in the actions, and, I, and those are uh, not being voted on tonight. They're, they were uh, to uh, explain expletive, uh, no, not expletive, expletive. <laughs> <laughs> They're not an expletive, okay. Um, That's good. Uh, so forgive me, yeah, I, I, I've been through a lot in the last month. Uh, so, but we can, I can look at where in the actions it makes sense to expand on that work and, and how um, to elevate it. So it's possible, yes. And, and, and I, I think one of, one of the things, as we go into implementation planning, we'll be looking at the timelines for each thing and where and what we're expanding and how we can manage that uh, without uh, dropping the ball, so to speak. Yeah, yeah and I don't want to, uh, I know there's been so much work up to this point, I don't want to get into you know editing or rewriting on the floor a single word or a comma, but if we could just kind of leave a little bit of room to um, maneuver in a couple of these areas in the future, I think that'd be useful. Um, the only other thing that uh, you know I had to observe about all this is, you know, I like 
how clean it is in terms of the measures the, that um, you know we're either increasing something like a graduation rate or we're decreasing something like a dropout rate. Um, I do think going forward, I would only ask Dr. Joseph that we pick two or three spots where we can articulate some you know, high leverage, you know, growth goals over a period of, you know, three to five years and pick, yes. not, like I know we can't do it with everything, but pick something that we know is attainable, that we know from research has, you know, extraordinary impact on uh, the whole of, of, of the student body, like reading at grade level by third grade, right. Um, right. whatever. So I don't know exactly, you know, kind of what those are and how that could look, but I, again, just in the category of giving it a little bit of room to breathe in the future, that's something I'd, I'd like to talk about another day. Sure. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Anybody else with any questions or comments? You're pretty thorough last night. So I would entertain a motion to um, approve the strategic plan 2017-18. Um, what, what you're actually approving are you're approving the, um, the goals, the strategies, and the KPIs because the plan uh, all together will come to you in April. Okay. All right. Goals, strategies, and KPIs. Okay, specifically, can I get a motion to approve the goals, strategies, and, and KPIs? I so move. Can I get a second? Second. Okay. Any discussion? All in favor? Show of hands. Approved? Yay, the motion passes. Yay. Thank you so much, Dr. Carlisle. Thank you all. Been very um, good, thorough. Good work. Thank, thank you. you. And thank you for the input. Thank you. Um, Dr. Joseph, do we have director support? Sure. Very, very briefly. Uh, we have, so thank you for uh, approving the elements of the strategic plan that's important because we want to now, um, on April 10th, we will have our state of schools and we have the information needed to form the basis of a strategic framework uh, to be able to pull together for you. And uh, as Mr. Pinkston just uh, discussed, you know, once you get the framework, what it won't have are our targets and, and timelines. That work still needs to continue, and that's why we're calling it a framework, because we don't want to deliver something to you without the timelines and the, the clear targets. Um, but, but the framework will be out for the public so they'll know in turn, in the, and for our community to know what direction we're moving towards, and then our, our work will continue in phase two as we lay out the rest of the work so we can be clear about setting those, those targets and so forth. But on the, at the State of Schools, it'll give us an opportunity uh, to really celebrate the hard work that we've done this year together as a board and an administration and to really uh, talk about particularly our, our budget highlights and, and why we feel these are the areas we need to be focusing on to move forward. But again, to celebrate you know, some of the great work that we've done this year and that meeting will be held at Cresswell Middle School, uh, prep for the arts. Uh, we've sent out the save the date a couple weeks ago and today we sent formal invites out to everyone. Uh, anyone in the community is invited to attend. Uh, we are asking um, for RSVPs to be encouraged, but it's not required, of course. Uh, we will have translators at the event and we'll accommodate other language needs upon request. And then also we're looking for, look for additional uh, information to come out uh, on our Facebook page about uh, the tenth, but it'll be a it'll be a good day, I think, for the system again to recap all the the great work that we've done. I want to take an opportunity to introduce uh, Ms. Lori Widener, who is our new executive officer for communications and community engagement. Uh, Lori, wave to everybody. So everybody sees who you are here. Lori, Lori will be replacing uh, Janelle Lacey, whose last full day with the district is this coming Friday, uh, but she will be uh, doing some part-time work with us in April to help us get through our state of the schools address, and we want to publicly acknowledge uh, Janelle for all of her work over the past few years uh, within this district. Uh, she has been you know, a champion in really helping us to elevate our communication strategy, and uh, we think her uh, work has moved us forward as a district, so we greatly thank you for all that you've done for us. But 
that Lori being new comes to us uh, new to Nashville and she's bringing 30 years of leadership experience across the educational spectrum uh, with expertise in educational policy and strategic communications. Uh, most recently, Lori served as the Assistant Vice Chancellor of Public Affairs uh, for the California State University Office of the Chancellor, uh, the largest four-year public higher education system in the nation serving 437,000 students, so our 86,000 now. She can handle it. <laughs> then, prior to that, uh, she held cabinet level positions with the California School Board Association, uh, the Rancho Santiago Community College District, and the Los Angeles County Office of Education. So we're happy to have Alari be a part of the MNPS team. So thank you for being here. And in terms of the next steps with our strategic plan, uh, now that the board has approved the last of the strategic plan elements, we're going to draft a full strategic plan framework, which will be shared with you on April 11th, so the day after our um, uh, our state of the schools. Uh, later this spring, we'll establish our baseline metrics, targets, and reporting timelines, and uh, this is a continuum of work. So even after the plan is fully drafted, it's a breathing, living document that will change and grow as we continue to identify new priorities. So once we once we lay it down, no, we'll be coming back to it frequently, and we do have the opportunity to adjust as we, we see fit. And that concludes uh, this director's report. Thank you, Dr. Joseph. We'll move on to committee reports. Um, the class, Ms. Bo. Yes. As usual, our state uh, legislature has been busy with education bills this year, and I will start with our perennial favorite vouchers. Um, there is uh, one primary voucher bill remaining at this point, the Opportunity Scholarship Pilot Program, which would apply only to Shelby County. Uh, House Bill 126 by Harry Brooks was approved in the House Education, Administrative, and Planning Committee last week and it's scheduled tomorrow in House Government Operations Committee. Its companion bill, Senate Bill uh, 161 by Brian Kelsey, was previously approved by Senate Education, but it has not been scheduled for uh, its next hearing. There are several other voucher bills that were filed but then fell away. Uh, Senator Gardenhire filed a voucher bill that would have applied to any school, uh, any school district with a priority school, but it was defeated in Senate Education last week. Senator Gresham filed a voucher bill that would have created a statewide education savings account program, and it was deferred until next year. And then there are still several uh, bills pending that would expand the eligibility requirements for the existing IEP voucher program. Uh, we have two bills uh, that are of interest um, concerning charter schools. House Bill 310 and Senate Bill 1197 by Brooks and Norris would allow districts to withhold an authorizer fee from charter schools, but it would also require school districts to share student contact information with charter schools. Additionally, it creates a $6 million capital grant program for charter schools, and it is scheduled for a hearing in the House Finance Committee and the Senate Education Committee this week. House Bill 267 and Senate Bill 263 by Brooks and Tracy would raise the charter school application fee from $500 to $2,500, and it was uh, approved by the House Education Committee. The Senate bill is scheduled for Senate Education. Uh, there is an administrative uh, bill uh, concerning every, the Every Student Succeeds Act, ESSA. It's being carried by Representative Hawk and Senator Norris. Uh, House Bill 308, Senate Bill 1198. It's on notice in the House Education Administrative and Planning Committee and the Senate Education Committee. It would revise various provisions regarding student accountability measures due to the implementation, impl excuse me, due to the implementation of federal law, including revising the way the State Board of Education and the Department of Education determine the performance level of a school. We have another couple of bills uh, that concern BEP uh, or school funding. Uh, House Bill 1377, Senate Bill 898 by Sargent and Johnson would create a minimum state BEP contribution for all school districts. This bill is on notice in House Education Administration and Planning Subcommittee and the Senate Education Committee this week. House Bill 1340, Senate Bill 1030 by Camper and Yarbrough would require the state to use the average teacher salary to determine the salary component of the BEP. It's on notice in the House Education, Administration and Planning Subcommittee and the Senate Education Committee this week. Um, and then we, we had a, a, a 
proposed revision to uh, the law that would grade schools, I mean, school districts on an A to uh, F uh, basis. And uh, this bill is House Bill 449, Senate Bill 536 by Forgety and Tracy. It has um, been amended to revise uh, the, uh, the, the grading system for schools that is set to go into effect next year. It's still a work in progress, but we're hopeful that we can get some relief from the bill passed last year that requires the department to assign a letter grade to all schools based on performance. The bill is scheduled for House Education, Administrative and Planning, and Senate Education this week. And finally, the bathroom bill, um, which was proposed by Pody and Beavers, House Bill 888, Senate Bill 771. It would require students in public schools and public institutions of higher education, education to use restrooms and locker rooms assigned to them based on their sex on their students' birth certificates, and it failed in Senate last week. It has been taken off notice in the House this week. And that concludes my report. Thank you, Ms. Brogue. Budget and Finance, Ms. Spearing. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, the Budget Committee um, met uh, March the 14th and again today on the 28th to hear the fiscal year 2017-2018 operating budget overview presented by Dr. Joseph and Chris Henson. Uh, we're continuing the tradition started by last year's board chair, Mary Pierce, whereby Channel 3 takes the budget presentations. So if individuals have missed a budget meeting or a budget presentation, you can catch up online uh, or on TV when the meetings are replayed. <coughs> Excuse me. This year, we invited the public to participate in the process at two different times. Uh, one was earlier today during the board meeting during public participation, and the second opportunity will occur next week on April the 4th uh, after the committee meeting. Um, it will, the committee meeting will begin at noon, and the public hearing will begin around 1 o'clock. You do not have to sign up to speak, and you'll have two minutes. Uh, the board is scheduled to vote on the budget on April the 11th, and this concludes my report. Thank you, Madam Chair. I do have a short um, board chair report tonight. Um, more than, um, if y'all have noticed, we have a lot of change going on. It's that C <laughs> word that makes everybody nervous. And so I will say that more than um, 10 months ago, we, we tasked our then candidate for director of schools, Dr. Sean Joseph, to have a laser focus on our student achievement and move that needle quickly. We don't have a day to waste, we said. That is a daunting task, no matter how talented a person is or how enthusiastic that person is in carrying out that task. As my colleague, Dr. Gentry, likes to remind us a lot, we as a Board of Education have three jobs, to create a budget, hire director of schools, and evaluate said director of schools. We've already approved a capital needs budget. We are now thick into an operating budget. We have had one director of school evaluation today and we'll craft another one this summer. If we insert ourselves into issues um, on how teachers teach, what teachers teach, how teachers improve, or anything other than our statutory obligations, we are exercising our authority in the operation aspect of our school system and that is not our job. Other decisions including especially operational decisions belonging to the director of schools and his designees. All the operational decisions belong, de decisions belong to the director of schools and his designees. One of my favorite sayings, and I said it a lot last year, was um, the description of insanity is to do the same thing in the same way and expect a different outcome. Folks, we have to make some changes if we want a different outcome for our students, and we do want a different outcome for our students. The word change has many meanings. Some are to alter, to transform, to change direction. And yes, we want all those meetings to belong to, to apply to our students. I urge the naysayers to be supportive of the changes already made and to those coming down the pike. The C word is scary and upsetting if you make it that way. But change can also be exciting. We hired, uh, we, we, um, we need Dr. Joseph and his staff we need to give them the space necessary to create that change that we hired them, him to create. The change necessary to realize our vision and goals that we have already set, and we spent a lot of time doing that. Otherwise, the changes we are are not his, but are our ver version of how Dr. Joseph should manage his staff. If we allow ourselves to declare the, the, the destination and determine the route, we can't be upset 
if we are disappointed when we veer off course. Where the rubber meets the road will be in the next director of school evaluation. If these changes are not eliciting the changes that we want to see in our students, then we need to face that at that time. And we, and we have a lot more hard decisions to make. So we're giving you the, the responsibility and the leeway. And that concludes my board report. Now we move on to announcements. We'll start with Dr. Gentry. Uh, I'd like to share um, um, some information that I received, and I think it also went to uh, Dr. Shepard, um, about the uh, Catherine Y. Brown Leadership Academy. Uh, Dr. Brown, who's been very active uh, in the Nashville community, working with several nonprofit organizations, uh, has traveled over spring break to Medellin, Colombia in South America, and she took uh, several young ladies with her um, from MLK. Um, they were a part of an inaugural international exchange program with the University of EAFIT and the Centro Colombia Americano Medellin, Medellin, Colombia in South America. This project is aligned with the 100,000 Strong in America's initiative. Um, they were selected um, to, to participate uh, in seven days of intense research, studying, and sharing, and social activities. Um, they were expected to adapt very quickly to their unfamiliar culture, and they uh, will hopefully get an opportunity to come before the board and share their experiences over spring break. Great. Dr. Brannon? Yes, last week I represented uh, TSBA uh, in Denver at the NSBA uh, conference, and the first event for uh, many of us, three of us, was to attend the delegate assembly with the other 49 states uh, being represented. We uh, worked on our beliefs and some policies and then move to resolutions that would be submitted to uh, our legislators in Washington. Uh, Bob Alvey from Jackson uh, is, serves as a board director, and Wayne Blair from Laverne is also being recognized on the national level. Tammy Grissom is our executive director of TSBA, and she was in attendance. As is the norm, Entertainment was provided by students from all over Colorado and also from Missouri. Notable speakers offered their perspectives on the importance of education, especially at this time in our nation. Uh, the speakers included uh, retiree Navy Captain Scott Kelly. He, he's a history-making astronaut, of course. Ariana Huffington, the founder of uh, Huffington Post, and Wes Moore, uh, who is a youth advocate, and the teacher tonight mentioned that his uh, book, The Other Wes Moore, is uh, part of her uh, delivery of instruction. Uh, he didn't. He said he didn't realize he was going to be on the required reading list of many <laughs> school students. Um, but there were also other noted uh, speakers. Now, uh, the president, Miranda Boer Beard from Laurel, uh, Mississippi, passed the gavel on to uh, presiding officer Kevin Syak from New Jersey. And he became a board member at 19, and now he's the youngest serving board member in the nation. Uh, Looks like he's 12. <laughs> his mantra is Education 2030 in honor of the students who are kindergartners now and will graduate at that time. Their message for NSBA is stand up for education, urging everyone to protect and preserve public education. In addition to all the general sessions, I attended one master class on disrupting poverty, where to start, and what to stop in order for students to be successful. My other uh, sessions included adult bullying and how to recognize it and deal with it effectively. And it comes in the form of teacher to student, teacher to teacher, administrators to teachers, parents to teachers, teachers to parents, board members to superintendents, board members to board members. I also attended two uh, technology uh, sessions. 
uh, and one of them was uh, led by a former employee, Keisha Ray. So we got to visit briefly. NSBA continues to promote advocacy for students and it wants to challenge those who do not believe that public schools are a vital part of our democracy. Uh, one superintendent mentioned, you know the old adage, the grass is greener on the other side? Not really. The grass is greener, he says, where it is watered. Thank you. Dr. Brandon, thank you. Mr. Pinkson. <clears throat> Thank you. We, um, we learned uh, something over the weekend uh, from the newspaper uh, around the release of new Vanderbilt uh, University polling about Nashvilleans' attitudes about different areas of government, and uh, it looks like our job approval rating is on the rise, which is a good thing, and uh, we don't get to hear that very often. Uh, but I think it's a testament to the work that we've been doing over the course of the past year, starting with uh, the conclusion of a successful director search and going through uh, the summer and fall and now the spring with the, the work of the framework that we approved tonight. And I think the other important part of that data uh, that I saw was uh, Nashvilleans overwhelmingly think public education is the top priority, should be the top priority of the city, and then Secondly, they think that um, we need more money. And I think if we can embark on a very intentional confidence campaign, which I think we're already on, but, but you know, put it, put it on steroids and show people that we've got a plan, the director has and his team have the ability to execute, and then I think at some point in the future go begin making the case um, much more publicly than we've been doing over the last few years around the fact that we are uh, underfunded as a school system. Part of it's due to state uh, inadequate funding, but, but you know, part of it is we just need to have the conversation locally as well. So Dr. Severe, I look forward to getting the research from around the country that will give us a starting point to have a more intentional conversation. Uh, Ms. Spearing, I appreciate your leadership on the budget committee this year. Would request that after we transmit the budget, uh, to, the to the mayor and even after the council uh, uh, approves an appropriation that we keep the budget committee intact for the rest of the year to keep talking about these funding issues. And um, I don't want to meet it every month and I know every we've all got enough meetings, but I think that seems like the right venue to continue um, sharpening our pencils about that. So we'd love to talk with you uh, about scheduling in the summer and fall some broader discussions and inviting the mayor's office in, into those conversations, because it's going to be a multi-year conversation to get from, you know, here to where, you know, we need to be. And uh, the only other thing I wanted to mention is give a shout out to uh, Dr. Lance Foreman, who is the departing principal of Smith Springs uh, Elementary School. Uh, Dr. Foreman, who is a fellow uh, Overton High School alum, go Bobcats, uh, recently uh, accepted a position on the faculty at Lipscomb University. Dr. Foreman uh, really did an outstanding job in fall 2015 opening uh, a new school, which is you know, kind of a Haley's Comet moment, uh, and he uh, built a very, uh, with his faculty and with the students and families there, built a very special place uh, that has probably more parent engagement than any other school in my district. And I think there are a lot of things that we can learn from what Lance and his team accomplished um, with, um, with Smith Springs Elementary uh, and uh, on down to parent engagement around the naming of the mascot, Go Ducks. So, um, so anyway, would just uh, thank you, Lance, for your service and uh, look forward to keeping you on speed dial for advice and counsel in the future. Thanks. Miss Springs stole Dr. Lance Foreman from one of my elementary schools, just saying. <laughs> well, and now Lipscomb stole him from us, so we can <laughs> stole him from today. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Uh, I want to thank Dr. Uh, Monique Felder for uh, scheduling a, another field trip for us. We are going to uh, see community achieve schools as a, a kind of a byproduct of visiting Pine Gap recently. And we're going to start in Mr. Pinkston School at Whitsitt Elementary. Uh, oh, this Wildcats. Go oh, Bobcats. Wildcats. Wildcats, yeah. excuse me. Bobcats, Wildcats, <laughs> Ducks. Uh, that'll be April 26th from 3 to 6. Uh, we look forward to hearing the State of School Address by Dr. Joseph on April the 10th at IT Cresswell at 10 o'clock. And Cito Narcisse and I will help to celebrate Education Day on April the 20th at 9.30 at the Goodlitzville City Hall with Leadership Goodlitzville. 
and the Nashville Area Chamber of Commerce will celebrate our high school academies of Nashville on April 24th from 4.30 to 7.30 when they announce this year's many awards. Okay, I um, want to let everybody know that there's a, a district-wide meeting about Encore this Thursday night from 6 to 7 at Weston Middle School. And then on Thursday, April, I'm sorry, Tuesday, April the 4th, CETA and RCS will be joining the Hillsborough Cluster Parents Group for a meeting at 530 at JT Moore. And um, also want to thank you, Dr. Joseph, for having these um, L5 reports. Um, and what I love so much tonight from Jolton was hearing from the students themselves. Mm -hmm. And um, as I then listened to some of the public speaking and hearing Mr. Moth want to talk about reducing flight, that's how you reduce flight is you go talk to these students because the changes that happen at Jolton, I mean, those kids were saying as seventh graders we weren't learning in the classroom. And um, we need to believe them when they tell us that. And so I appreciate the efforts that you guys have been doing on that. Um, for, for the changes in those kids' education. And I do want to say thank you to Janelle Lacey for all of her hard work the last two and a half years. I really appreciate what you've brought to the district and wish you all the best. Thank you, Ms. Pierce. I have no announcements. Um, would you mind doing the honors, please? Be there no further business. This meeting is adjourned. Thank you.